Well, good morning. Uh, we've been in the middle of a series working through uh, about, uh, about uh, uh, the monsters that attack our faith, the different things that kind of knock us down, the things that kind of knock us backwards. There's a book by John Mark Homer called Live No Lies that I, I borrowed pretty heavily off of with uh, thinking about the sermon and getting through the series. And, and, uh, and we're going to be doing a book study on that over the next couple of weeks, and I'm looking forward to meeting with whoever uh, is, is part of that. And, and uh, uh, and uh, and do all that thing. We we uh, this morning at the church here, our internet and our phone are out, and uh, which shouldn't be that big a deal. Churches have been working for thousands of years before either of those things. But but uh, but we get so used to it, and uh, we get used to being able to make the the projector work like we want it to. And we've had to work on that extra today because. Our projector wants the internet, and we and the programs want the internet. And then and then I had to write my sermon out longhand, so. I'm a little nervous about that. So if, if, we, if, we get, if we get off track, you know, in the middle of this, wow, it seems like we're really kind of heading down a, a dark path or heading down a strange uh, a corridor, it's just because I had to ride out longhand. So don't, don't be nervous about that. And if it's your first week, uh, hopefully by next week we'll be right back to the, the 21st century and I'll be right back on the computer again and, and it'll just smooth just like that. So uh, how many of you know what Napster is? Napster. Now, you're kind of telling your age here a little bit. Uh, uh, you can be too old to care what Napster was, and then certainly if you're born after, say, 1995, you probably don't care what Napster was either. But, but, but there's that middle band there. Now, Napster was, was the first uh, music file sharing uh, uh, program, and, and you, could put, you could put your uh, music there on Napster, uh, your, your CD or your, or your tape cassette or whatever, and record that and load that up on Napster, and then any of your buddies could share it. They could see your music uh, for, for free. And, and, and in our day with Spotify and Apple Music and all these different kinds of things, it's hard to imagine an era maybe when that, that wasn't true. And if you were born, say, after 1995, it's hard to imagine the, pre, the pre-Napster era on that because uh, in the past, you'd have to go buy the CD if you wanted to hear it. You'd have to go to the store, and it was, I don't know, $12, $15 to buy a CD. And, and, and so you had to think real hard about it. Minimum wage then was five or six dollars. Is this worth three hours of my life to get the new CD by whoever this band is? Is this worth this much money to get this to get this thing? And 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 so you'd take a chance if it was a band that you really like. But if it was some new band or some band you didn't care that much about, you probably wouldn't probably wouldn't do it. And Napster opened up all those doors. I could go to Napster and the music was all there and it was all for, all for free. What a, what a wonderful world we lived in. Well, th- th- there was a band, uh, uh, Metallica. How many of you remember Metallica? Also showing your age there. Okay, but that's, a, that's all right. Uh, uh, Metallica, a bunch of long-haired, uh, 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 ne'er-do-well, uh, a hard rock, heavy rock band. They're in the, in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And, and, and they, they were working on a song for the Mission Impossible movie. And, uh, and they, they worked real hard, I don't, uh, and they went to bed that night, and they woke up the next morning, and, and they heard the song on the radio, but they hadn't released it yet. They hadn't even mixed it yet, not completely. It wasn't finished, and somebody had stolen it out of the studio and put it on that Napster. Well, the guys in Metallica, they were, well, they were upset. They were really ticked off about that. So they sued Napster for like $10 million because they said, you're, you're stealing you're stealing our stuff. And Napster said, oh, come on, whine about it, you bunch of rich crybaby, ne'er-do-well, heavy rock metal guys. Why, why, do you, why, why do you care? It doesn't hurt you at all. And they said, it doesn't matter if we're rich. Stealing is stealing. Wrong is wrong. There used to be, it's, it's a different world now, but used to when you'd buy, a, buy one of those uh, video cassettes. I mean, you know what video cassettes are. Never mind. Anyway, video cassettes. <laughs> and, and you'd buy the video cassette, and you'd, you'd slide it in there. And almost immediately on the video cassette, you'd get a warning. Piracy is a crime. Piracy is a crime. It's theft. If you steal this movie, you record it onto another uh, tape and then take that tape and give it to us, that's, that's theft. You're stealing. And used to, you, every video you got would have that warning there at the beginning. They'd show, they'd show a guy stealing a car at the beginning. And then they might show a guy breaking into a house, has a crowbar. And then the next thing, there's a guy recording off the movie. It's all crime. It's all, it's all theft, and you can't do it. And this was the era. And, and again, if you're born after this era, it's just hard to appreciate what was going on? Because there's no gray area here. Metallica was right. It's, it's stealing. There's a commandment about that, you know? I mean, it wasn't, wasn't like there's a mystery about who was right and who was wrong. 
But as a kid who lived, well, I was not a kid then. I was in my late 20s, early 30s uh, during this stretch. As, a, as somebody who lived during this time, it was just so easy to, to do it, and everybody was doing it. And it, it did seem like you were kind of the Robin Hood character in this deal. Metallica had all the money, and you were just some poor kid trying to make a living. And, and, and so how big a deal is this in the big scheme of things? It just didn't seem like that big a deal. And, and so i I got to confess to you all these years later, I downloaded some illegal, uh, some illegal songs. I actually downloaded several illegal songs. And I, and I didn't really feel that bad about it at the time. It didn't even make me feel that guilty. It didn't bother me that much. I was able to sleep at night and, and not really have a, a twisted conscience about this at all. My friend Pat, though, did have a twisted conscience about it. He was, he was looking into this thing, and he said, you know, I just don't know. I think, I think Metallica was right all along, which is a sentence that no one's ever said in the history of the, of the world. I think Metallica was right all along, you know? I think they knew what was going on, and we didn't know what was going on, and so maybe this is theft. And I don't think as a Christian we should be doing it. And, and a lot of people piled on. Oh, come on. It doesn't hurt anybody. It's not that big a deal. And, and again, there was never a gray area. And they might even get mad at Pat. I mean, my friend would say, oh, you're just judging us. Don't you judge us. Who do you think you are, you know, and we're not doing anything wrong. And, and like, judging was worse than stealing in that, in that paradigm. You know, yeah, I'm stealing, but at least I'm not judging people. And, 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 and judging people was even, was even worse. And, 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 and that's the world. When you're trying to figure out what the world is, that's the world. That's what the world is. It's, everybody's doing it. Everybody's going this direction. So we decide because of that what's up and down and right and wrong. Now, over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the three big monsters that attack us, the, the devil and the flesh and the world. And we even defined it a little bit. The devil, that's deceptive ideas, right? The devil's lying to you. He's whispering lies to you. And they're, and they're not just any lies, but they're lies that appeal to your disordered desires. They appeal to the animal part of you. They appeal to your flesh right? And when he's whispering lies and it appeals to your desires and you're in a sinful society, it gets pretty easy to, to, to offend and justify what you're doing. Well, everybody's doing it. How big a deal is it if everybody's doing it? I, and you, you determine what's right and wrong and up and down based on what you see people around you doing, and, that, and that's the world. And it doesn't have to really be right or wrong. It doesn't have to really be up or down. But if everybody's doing it, we can kind of defend it in our head and make it seem like it'd be okay it'd be okay for us. And we let the world decide what kind of people we're going to be. Now, Jesus warned us about this thing. He, he did. He said, uh, he said, what good is it if, if somebody could win the whole world but lose their soul? In other words, it's possible, he says, to live in such a way that the whole world will applaud every decision that you make, but you're still going to be ruined at the end. Right? And, and it doesn't take uh, like a hard search through like People Magazine or, or TMZ website or something like that. And you see that people, just because they're famous and good looking and rich, they still struggle with addiction. They still struggle with, with um, things like anorexia and, and, and self-doubt. You still people get into these huge clouds of depression. I've got a little bit of a cough. I coughed first service and I turned my head like this to cough. I'm wearing a microphone. And it's still... Uh, Still shocked the church pretty good when I did it. So I'm going to try not to do that to you. Uh, here's second service if I, if I can. Halls. Oh, Jesus said, it's possible for you to please the whole world, but still lose the bigger part of you. And so you need to make right decisions on this thing. You need to make sure that how you're defining right and wrong goes with what God thinks and then keeps you on a straight path. So let's think about what the world is and what the world means. Uh, the world in the Bible uh, gets used two or three different ways. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we'll try not to have that happen again. I was fighting it all morning. Uh, the world, uh, in English, the word ball can mean two or three things. You could play with a ball. You could go dance at a ball. You could have a ball, I meaning you're having fun. And the, and the same English word means lots of different things. Well, world is like that in Greek and in Hebrew. It means two or three different things. On the one hand, it can mean the, the planet, right? Um, so um, the song we sang earlier, I'm in the forest glade, or I'm on the mountaintop, I think how great you are, God. Uh, that's the world, and, and that's a good thing. We're, God's not against that world at all. 
That's not a thing that's going to hurt you. In fact, a lot of people could do quite a bit of good just going to sit under a tree sometime and just and think about their life and think about where they're going and what they're doing. Um, there's also a way to look at the world where you're talking about people, like all the people of the world. And the Bible's not against that either in terms of just the people. Uh, John 3.16, God so loved the world, gave his only son. And that kind of a picture of the world, we're supposed to do that. We've got a sign in the back of the church here We're encouraging all of our people to talk about their faith to others who who may or may not share it, to share your story or to share what you know about Jesus or to invite somebody to church. And if you do that during the week, encourage you to light up one of the bulbs there in the back, light it up and and let people know that the gospel's for everyone and we want to love the world and, and reach out to the world as much as we can. But there's another way that the world can get used, that phrase in the Bible, and it, it refers to sinful society. And, and specifically, it, it's society and, and culture without God's influence. It's what, it's what the world would be without God in, influencing it at all. It, it, it's, it's, it's how the world acts and thinks and, and operates without. You know, you think about in history, uh, how could a country like ours enslave people for hundreds of years? I mean, how, how, how does that happen? Well, it, it happens slow. You know, at first it's, it's not everybody, but it's just a few people, and then before too long it's kind of a tipping point, and there's a lot of slaves being brought in, and it seems like some of the families that have slaves are, are richer maybe than some of the families that don't, and so that becomes attractive. And so there's more and more families coming in with slaves, and then eventually there's a tipping point. There's so many families with slaves, well, who am I to say what's right and wrong? You know, who am I to judge anybody else? Maybe that's okay, and, 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 and suddenly your whole culture sunk. It, it doesn't happen fast. It, it just, it's just a gradual accept. How did Hitler get a whole nation of, of, of Europeans to, to, to go for his brand of Nazi thinking? How does that happen? Well, it's the world. It's, it's, everybody's on the same page. Everybody's talking the same way. It's, it's, it's getting into the media. It's getting into the magazines and the books that they were allowed to read. And before too long, it's just how everybody thinks. And you don't, really, uh, you don't really question it any longer. It's just, it's just what everybody's doing. It's what everybody believes. It's what everybody... There, there's a, a, a Netflix show a couple of years ago called 13 Reasons Why. And in the deal, it talks about suicide. And they found, net, the, the peop, people who study such things, that after Netflix released this thing, that the number of suicides went up. It's kind of a crazy thing. How's that possible? How, how could just watching something like it on television influence people to, to but it's, it's how the world works. If enough people start kind of going that direction, you can make the assumption that the man's what the right way is. If everybody's doing it, man's what I should do too. And I know this sounds childish, but, but, but we see it. Um, there's, a, there's a woman named Abigail Schreier. She's, she's a, a, a progressive Jew. Uh, she's an author and a journalist. And she's, she's wrote a couple of books that I think are really, really interesting. And in one of the books, she talks about the transgender uh, stuff that's going on. And she says, as long as medical data has been kept on this thing, transgender has, for generations, been almost exclusively a male problem. Men would, would, would think that they were women or think that they should be women. Men would, would start to dress the, that way and, and start to do things to become like women. And when I say the majority, I mean like 99%. It wasn't like it was close. I mean, it was almost all men until the last 10 years. And the last 10 years, the, the, the majority is teenage and 20-year-old women. And the Schreier says, is it possible that this is not some genetic phenomenon we're seeing, but more of a social contagion? that people are seeing others do it, that there's been a tipping point, and now people are confused about something they weren't confused about before. Well, she just, she's getting all sorts of hate and death threats and everything else. How dare you, you bunch of Christians? And she says, I'm not a Christian. And she's not a Christian. She doesn't believe any of the Christian things. Uh, she says, I, and I'm not even saying I'm right. I may be wrong, she says. But, but I mean, when you, see, when you see all of this science on one side of this thing, and then in just a few years, it changes so fast. Isn't it possible there's more things going on here than we're, we're aware? Oh, I can't believe you didn't bring that up. What a hate-filled bigot you are. And, and they just shout her down. And, and, and you can't even question things. There's a party line, and you, we've all got to be on the same party line. If you don't say the same thing all the rest of us are saying, then you're the kind of person we need to watch out for. We need to keep you on a list of some sort because we all got to think the same. And that's the world. 
And it's, it's just such a common deal that you don't even realize it. It's like you're living in the matrix. You don't, you don't even realize you're in the matrix until someone points it out. And then even when your eyes are open and you can see it for the first time, other people don't see it. And that's the world. And it's just how we operate. And it's just how we think. And we're told to be pretty careful about this thing. We're told to be uh, uh, pretty smart about how much influence we let this get over us. Uh, Proverbs, way back in the Old Testament, says, When you walk with the wise, you become wise. But a companion of fools will suffer harm. In other words, who your friends are has a way of making a difference to who you are. And no, none of us like to think that that's us, right? Well, yeah, for the weak-minded out there, the feeble-minded, sure, that may be it. But for somebody as sophisticated as myself, I think I could see through. But, I mean, think about it in your own life. Your first beer, your first cigarette, your first look at porn. Almost certainly, if there was somebody else there, they were an idiot, Right? I mean, almost for sure, if there was somebody else there, uh, you, were, you weren't at church club meeting, you weren't at a 4-H meeting when that happened, almost for sure, uh, <laughs> you weren't at basketball practice, almost for sure, with a bunch of ne'er-do-well, probably Metallica lovers, and there you were, and next thing you know, you're doing something stupid. It's why parents, it's why parents will tell their kids sometimes, I don't know if I like this friend, and the kid gets all offended, oh, come on. Don't you think I'm smart enough to see what's going on here? I, I, I'm trying to be an influence on them. And the parents say, I don't know. It looks like they're influencing you more than you're influencing them. Oh, come on. Don't you trust me? And what should the parents say then? No. No, I don't. Why? Because you're the same way. Because every one of us is the same way. I, I, I mean, if, if you don't watch out, you can just assume that what everybody else is saying is the right thing. Well, they're all saying it. They're all doing it. It's why people wear bell bottoms, or did at one time. <laughs> so, uh, when we think about the world, probably the best teaching on this thing is in First John chapter two. He says, "Don't love the world," John says, "or anything in the world, because if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in him." And so it's kind of like a teeter totter there. The more weight you give to the world, well, then God's not going to have much influence. And it kind of works like that. So the more you allow the world to dictate what, and that can be anything. That can be your politics. That can be your media consumption. It can be your celebrity worship. It can be what your friends are all doing. It, it, the more you give weight to that, God, God gets second shift on that deal. So you, and it can work the other way. The more you focus in on what God wants to have, the, the quieter the world will seem. And, uh, and you make a decision there. That's what that verse says. Don't love the world or anything in the world because if you love the world too much, you're going to be losing love for God. And he says the things in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, that comes not from the Father but the world. And here's how he defines the world, John does. He's, his, his definition is it's the lust of the flesh, it's your appetite, right? I'm hungry. Um, uh, uh, certainly, because that uses the word lust, it can have a sexual connotation, but it's not just sexual. It's any appetite. It's the person who knows that they shouldn't eat one more cookie, but maybe just one, and then, and then they do it again. It's the person who does know they shouldn't drink at all, but maybe just one, and then, and then I'll go right home. It's the person who knows they shouldn't, but then they do, and it's that lust of the flesh. I have an appetite. I've got to sate that appetite. And you know, of course, don't you? You know, of course, with appetites, that the more you sate the appetite, the stronger the appetite gets. And you're, you logically will never think that. You're, you're, the, the devil will whisper into your ear, oh, come on, if you, if you just had one, that'd be enough. And what do they say about potato chips? Uh, nobody can have just one, right? Right? Or at least certain kinds of potato chips. And, and really, all of Madison Avenue, all of the advertising takes advantage of this impulse. You know, look at this pretty car with the model driving it. Shouldn't you be driving something like that? Maybe she'd be sitting with you. Look at this beer here. Everybody's got six-pack abs. Well, that doesn't make any sense. No, look at the picture here. Wouldn't that be cool if that could be you? And, 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 and you see the pictures, and, you, and, and it appeals to the appetite. Lust of the eyes is, is, is coveting. It's, it's the wanting things you don't have. And learning not to be happy with what you have because you don't have what somebody else has. Well, I should be here, or I should do this, or I should be this by now. And so you're never content, you're never satisfied. And that pride of life is just boasting, refusing to be wrong. It's, 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 a, 
it's uh, always sticking to your guns, even when everybody else sees that you're, you're on a lost cause. It's, it's, it's refusing to say you're sorry. Um, that's a bigger problem than I think I was aware of. Um, and maybe it's, I'm just stupid about this sort of thing, I guess, but it's just a bigger problem. I, I think there's a lot of people in the world who just have a real hard time backing down that triggers something deep, deep, deep in their heart. And, and, and the world encourages you not to be that way. It's, it tells you, no, 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 be true to yourself, to your own heart, you know, be true. And, and you do you, and that's the world. And, and that lust of the flesh, my appetite, lust of the eyes, and that coveting and pride of life, all the boasting I do, he says, that, God, that has nothing to do with God. And the more weight I give to things like that, the less powerful God's going to be in my life. And so he says the world and its desires pass away. All those things are temporary. But if you can do the will of God, you're going to live forever. It's about being part of something bigger, more important, more precious, more powerful And no one's going to necessarily applaud when you start walking down this path. But they'll see it eventually. If God God really did make the world, if Jesus really is God in the flesh, then the things that they tell us to do, are it really is the best way to live. And it will show up if you'll hang in there. If you go to a church conference, like a church growth conference, they'll talk a lot at those conferences about being relevant to the world. We need to reach the culture, you know. We need to speak their language. We need to be able to get into what people are going through and and really be on their level. And and, and I will say that we've adopted some of those things here. We don't want to be strange for the sake of being strange, and we don't want to be hard to understand if we can be clear. But sometimes you can go too far with that thing and think that the way to get people to come in here is to be like them. and, And that... The early church stood out because it was different than anything else, radically crazy different than anything else. Jesus believed that each person was worthy of God's love, for God so loved the whole world that he gave his son, that he loves the small and the, and the tall and the, and, the, and, the, and the big and the tiny. He loves the rich and the poor, black and white, and, and he, 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 didn't, he loves them all. And the early church was diverse. It reached out to anybody, and it, and it elevated the poor. I mean, if, if we saw somebody in a, in a bind, we tried to lift them up. Well, what if you don't get anything out of it? Well, you don't get anything out of it. I mean, each person is precious. Each person is precious, and if I can lift them up, it's worth it. Just, and there was just nobody else saying that thing then. Julius Caesar didn't agree with that. Caesar thought that riches was a sign of God's blessing. Uh, so did most of the philosophers of that time. Uh, most philosophers assumed that the rich have a right to dominate the poor. Th- th- this notion that all men are equal, that all people are equal, that's a Jesus idea. No one was saying it before him. Jesus said, because, because you are so precious, because you, because you are so um, precious, that, that we need to elevate even the children he says some verses like that. Bring the children to me, he says. Now, in the early Roman world, they didn't do abortion like we, like we do. I mean, they didn't have the surgical capabilities that we do. But there was some abortion where you would take medicines or different things to, to maybe go for. And there was a lot of infanticide where you would, if you had a baby and you wanted a boy, but you had a girl, you would take her out to the woods and just leave her there and let nature take its course. And that happened a lot. It wasn't, it was common. Um, and the church started saying, no, we're not going to let that happen anymore because each person's precious. Each person's valuable. Each person deserves a chance, and each person is loved by God. And no one else was thinking that way then. No one else was saying those things. It's only Jesus. And when the church started saying those things too, a lot of the culture around said, oh, come on. And, and it offended them. The early church stood out sexually compared to everybody else. For the most part, the Roman thoughts on sexual stuff, particularly for men, was anything goes. Um, 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 men were expected to keep a mistress and were expected to go see prostitutes. It's just an appetite was the Roman thinking on this. And men, 
are supposed to sate that appetite however they need to sate it. It was common for women, not as common as for men, but it was common to see women carry on that way too. It was common to see uh, what we would see as pedophilia today, where a man would adopt a, a teenage boy or a, a 10 or 11, uh, 9 or 10 or 11 year old boy and, and make them a sexual slave. That was common. It happened all the time. It was the way that things were. The strong dominate the weak. And when the church said, we shouldn't be this way anymore, a lot of people didn't like it. And they were offended by it. The church wasn't trying to reach the culture. They were trying to lead the culture. And it offended a lot of people. The church preached the thing about nonviolence, that we aren't supposed to get even. You know, if someone strikes you on the right check, cheek, then you let them hit the left cheek. You just don't, you don't try to get even. If someone hurts you seven times, then you forgive them seven times. You forgive them 70 times, seven times. And you, 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 you just don't close the door on people. Love always hopes. It always protects. It always trusts. It always perseveres. And nobody else was saying that then either. In fact, a lot of people aren't saying that today. It always kind of stood out in contrast to what our flesh wants to do. And certainly to the lies the devil's telling. I mean, the church was distinctive and different. And, and they were saying, if you follow these kinds of things, you're going to have a better life. You're going to flourish. Now, now, why? Think this thing through for a second. Why has You talk to the hardest atheist that you know, and he will be much closer to Jesus on all those things I just talked about than he will be to Julius Caesar or Genghis Khan or Nebuchadnezzar, or any of the great leaders of the past. The hardest atheist you know will say, you know, Jesus was pretty much, he won't say it like that, but it's pretty much right about people being worthwhile, and about racism, and about, about being caring for little children, and about how sexual abuse is terrible. The hardest atheist you know, who, who rejects God in every other atmosphere, he's adopted most of the Christian ethic on this thing. Why? Why would the world evolve like it has? Because it absolutely works. The, the, the life of Jesus, it, it, it just works. The God who made us has designed us to be a certain kind of person, and when we walk in his path, we flourish. And it's hard, it, 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 and, and you see it. You notice it. It, it has an aroma to it. That, that, that's, that's magnetic that you just can't hardly resist. I mean, when a person makes a decision to put God first, they, they shine. And we're called to be those kinds of people. Now, the first week we talked with the devil, I said he lies to you all the time, and the antidote to that was to read your Bible more. you got to know what he says. you got to get involved in Bible studies. you got to get involved in just keeping up with it. Memorize some verses. But you, you've got to get the Bible in your head. That's, that's, that's the secret. Last week we talked about the flesh and our disordered desires. And, and the secret there is to learn to love and to serve more and to push yourself out there a little bit more. But with the world, the solution to that is the church. Now before I get into this thing, even this morning I had a conversation with somebody. I recognize the church is flawed. Some of the most painful moments of my life have been at the hands of church people acting on church business. And some of that is because of the, of the occupation I've chosen, and I, and I see that. But, but I have found that sometimes Christians can be just as mean or meaner than anybody else that you know. Um, the church is full of hypocrites, say people outside the church. And if you're being honest with yourself, it's probably true. I mean, I want to do the right thing, yet I, yet I retain this awful capacity to do the wrong thing provoked a certain way. I want to be the right kind of person, yet I know myself. And I'm sitting amongst people who are the same as me on this. Nobody has it all figured out. We're all broken. And yet I am convinced, I remain convinced that the church of God is the hope of the world. When a people come together and say, we want to put God first, and we're going to do the best we can to keep him first, and we're going to try to love and serve each other. We're going to be guided by Scripture, and we're going to put him first, and we're going to forgive freely. We're going to follow his example. I continue to believe that it's the antidote to everything that's going wrong. And the world is hungry for that sort of thing, even if they don't know it. I, I, I've, I've never wavered on that, and I believe it now more. When I first got into ministry, I was a youth minister. I was not a great youth minister. 
I was, I was not a popular kid in high school. I did not get more popular as I left high school. It wasn't like, oh, the older nerd is much more interesting than he was when he was younger. No one, no one took that attitude as me. I was president of my FFA. But it didn't have much social credibility to that. And people weren't that impressed with it. And it didn't really lead me. But I did the best I could. As a youth minister, I, I did the best I could. I tried really hard. And I tried to love on them. And it seemed like, especially at first, my youth group was a lot of broken kids. Uh, most of the kids in my youth group did not have two parents at home. Most of the kids in my youth group were dealing with some pretty heavy stuff. Stuff that I had never dealt with. I grew up in Paoli. We never, some of those things we never had to, to fool with. Or if they did, I never, I never went to those places. But I'm, I'm helping them navigate it and trying to figure it out, and trying to figure out what's going on, and how can we get this thing together. I remember one girl there, and her name was Dawn, and Dawn came every week, but she was just so ticked off, and she was just so ticked off, and, 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 and it was easy to make her ticked off, and I don't know all the reasons she was ticked off, but I know there was things going on, and, and her family, there was, there was some stress there, and, and, and like in every family, right, and, and there was things going on, and, and, uh, but she kept coming, and, and I kept talking to her, and I I really loved her, and I loved her family, and, and I tried the best I could. And I saw the other night, I'm on, I'm on Facebook, and there's this picture of her, and she's with her, with her husband now. They've been married almost 20 years and, and 25 years, and there's, there's just all these kids, and they're, they're getting older now too, and one of the kids has got a, a fiancé, and they're just, I mean, it's, everything's looking, so, and, I, and, I, and I wrote her on Facebook. I said, way to go. You know, Dawn, you did it. You know, you did it. I'm so proud of you. And she writes back, um, that means more than you know. And that's the church. That's, that's the church that doesn't let go of somebody to spin off the, the rails. I, I go to church camp every year, and I'm, and I'm just caught by it. And it's not so much, again, the youth, though I, I enjoy hanging out with, with, with the kids. But I know my own strengths and weaknesses. It's just, it's just getting away from the world for a few days. There's something so magnetic about that. And usually the first couple days, it's, it's not smooth, but by about Tuesday or Wednesday, we've, we've gotten far enough away from the world that people are genuinely starting to look out for each other, and they're genuinely starting to talk like a redeemed community would talk, and, and, and it just changes. You can feel the Spirit blow through it, and, and it's what heaven's going to look like. And, and it's not the same kind of thing. I, I went to this, uh, this has been five or six, seven years ago now, this ministry called Kairos up at uh, Putnamville Prison, and they bring all these prisoners in. There's like 42 prisoners, and then there's, there's us. We're all there. There's, there's, there's 40 of us, and it mostly appeals to retired men. That's who, that's who mostly is serving uh, with these guys. And so I take a quick glance around. I'm the youngest guy of the volunteers, and all the prisoners are in their 20s. So you think, okay, well, if this goes sideways... You know, we'll be reading about this. Well, aren't we reading about it? But people will be reading about it in the, in the paper. And, and so you just try to love people. You just love them. And the first couple of days, they're real guarded. It's a four-day thing. And the first couple of days, they're real guarded. You know, they want to see if you really mean it or not. And you don't judge. You just, you just love them. You just, you just love them. And, and uh, here's the way. And, and the light bulb starts coming on. And there was one guy there, and his dad and his uncle are both in prison with him. And it's like, I've never heard any of this stuff. I didn't even know this was possible. And I'm not a moron. I know that some of those people at Kairos and some of those people at Teen Week will leave there and go right back to the hole that they came out of. The world is really strong. It's, it's really, man, it can get its hooks in you and you, it's really tough. But to see eyes open, you know, there was this guy, Mark, in the Kairos thing and and he says, I'm starting to say please and thank you again. Because you don't ever show manners at prison. You don't show weakness of any sort. He's starting to change me, he says. And that's the church. I've got a friend named Bill, and, and I go see Bill every week or two. And I went to see him every week or two for years. And uh, he's just the coolest old man. I've always thought he was. Uh, uh, I've just got so many different, he took the kids all sledding when he was in his 80s, and he's in his 80s flying down the hill in this sled that he made himself, and, and I remember thinking, watching that, that that's, that's the old kind of old man I want to be, and every time I would talk to him, I would feel, I would leave feeling smarter than I was when I went in, because he always had some, he's a super gentle guy, and, 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 and the big thing he and I have in common is Jesus, it wasn't like 
there's a lot to draw he and I together except for Jesus, but, but I, I just so enjoyed getting his perspective on things. When his grandson was in the youth group here, he wanted to get his grandson and the other high schoolers to come out to his house. So he and his wife, and they're like 82 or 3, would watch Walking Dead with the high school youth group. <laughs> and I would ask Bill, I would say, Bill, do you enjoy that? Oh, no. He says, I, I, uh, it's a terrible show. But I like, he says, I like, I like having all the kids in. And they're all sitting on the floor there, and June makes them something to eat, and we all just hang out and talk. And I remember thinking, again, this is exactly the kind of old man I want to be. This is exactly who I want to be. When I'm his age, if I live long enough, I want to be just like this. And he died. He died this week. And uh, his funeral is going to be tomorrow uh, for, for Bill Beavers here at the church tomorrow at, at 1. And, uh, and, uh, but it wasn't like when other people die. We're all there together, and, and uh, everybody knows where he's going. He's lived the same way his whole life, and, 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 and you see the evidence of it all over the place. You, you, you can see what he stood for. You, you, you can see what he believed. I mean, you don't have to wonder about where he was at. And it's not like he was a perfect person because there are no perfect people. And it wasn't like he was not a hypocrite in bad moments because everybody has that thing. And it wasn't like his kids didn't occasionally think they needed counseling because they're growing up with him because we're all sinners, and that's what people do. Uh, But there's a power in a life authentically lived for Christ. And it, it's palpable. You can, you can taste it. it. It looks like something. And that's the church. And the reason we beat this drum so much about you getting involved in small groups or you getting involved a little deeper here in the program is there's something so powerful. It's not uncommon at all for somebody to tell me, this is the best part of my week. When I get with my small group and we, we just, and, and what do you talk about? We might talk about, who knows? It could be anything. You start by talking about the Bible study, but it might launch off onto some other thing. And, and, and I'm, I'm learning about their lives and I'm getting to know them better. And, and we're walking through this thing together. And, and, and that's the church. And, 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 and the reason we beat that drum so hard is because it, it works. It just, it just, it just works. And just to get a little taste of that in the middle of everything else that's going on, maybe just the nudge you need to do the right thing. Because the devil's not going to quit working, and your flesh is always going to war against you. So to hear a competing voice against what the world is blasting into your ears, such a precious thing. I remain convinced that the church of God is the hope of the world. I remain convinced that we all, us here at Mount Pleasant, are the best hope for Bedford, not because we're so smart or because we're so pretty or because we're so talented. Because we know who God is. And if God gets in the middle of it, it can change everything. So I'm going to pray for you and uh, ask God to move in your lives. If anybody in here needs to make any sort of a decision to draw close to God, we want to give you a chance to do that here at the end of the service. And I'll talk about that in a second. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, I just... I just thank you for this group, and I ask you, God, to put your hand on them. And if there's somebody here who, who feels like they are pretty distant from you, that maybe they've listened to too many of those lies and they've, they've allowed themselves to, to go places and do things maybe they, they wish they hadn't, I pray, Father, you help strengthen them up. For the person who feels alone, kind of battered by the world, um, feels like they don't measure up, I pray, God, you hold them up strong. And, and Father, let us lean into each other here. In Jesus' name, amen.